chapter 23. Kind of go along with what I did when I started our, our service with this part of it, the memory verse we've got. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards to be that a man be found faithful. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And as we mentioned, faithfulness is what God's looking for. Amen. In our hearts and our lives. It's easy enough to put on the good look on Sunday morning, good looks on Sunday night, maybe come Wednesday night and look like the thing, look like the proper individual, but boy, it's different when Monday comes for a lot of people. Amen. Uh, this back into the things of the business of the world and not to the business of God. Uh, true Christianity is a seven-day, 24-hour, 365 glorious privilege that we should live for the Lord. Amen? Not a once in a while thing. Now, uh, there are a number of woes in the book of Matthew, chapter 23. Just going to touch a few of them. This is where I kind of uh, got to in my study. And so, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, ye hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have uh, omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a net and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like, like, like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Verse 28. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Let us pray. Father, we come before your throne and desire for your will to be done. Lord, in me and my life and Father, in this message and to each one that hears, I pray, Father, wherever they may be, God, that they might be able to draw closer to you. Uh, and Father, for the time that we share, saint and sinner alike, uh, that we might be humbled under your hand, uh, the Holy Spirit's leadership, and God, for your power to move upon us. Give us what's needed. Touch our hearts and lives, Father. Open up the altar for a time of prayer by your Holy Spirit's moving. And I pray that each one might be able to say when this time of worship is done this morning, that being in the house of God has been a good place where we felt your Spirit. We're obedient to it, Father, in the Word. And our lives, God, are more blessed because of it. I gather us closer to you in Christ our Savior's wonderful name we pray. We ask these favors in Jesus. Amen. I think about the uh, title of the message uh, that God knows. And uh, Brother Gary kind of talked about uh, the omnipresent God, uh, that God is everywhere. And this is the omnipotent God. Amen. The all powerful God, the all knowing God, and the ever present God. And He knows, amen, what's going on in our lives. He knows everything about us. I remember that Jesus talked about uh, that the very hairs of our head are numbers. Now if you think about that, God knows that extent about us. There's not anything in our heart that He doesn't know. There's not any thought that we have uh, that He doesn't know all about. And He knows all about us. Therefore, let's be honest with Him. Amen. And allow His Holy Spirit to deal with us in the way that's needed that we might be open to His leadership for altar of prayer, or for the study of the Word, for Him to speak to our heart, and that we might be found pleasing to Him in all the things that He'd have us to do. When you go to the doctor, 
the physician, you go to a clinic and sometimes they can't find out what's going on by looking on the outside so they have to take some kind of other test measure uh, to figure out what's on the inside. And that's the way that God does. Amen. We look on the outside. God looks on the inside. And you think about the radiation uh, x-ray. You think about the CAT scan and all these different tests they do to find out exactly what's going on inside you. And God does His, amen, His scan of our heart and our minds and our life. And He knows everything about us. He reads where we are with Him. And Jesus is talking to those uh, that are highly religious. But it also applies to those that are barely religious. Amen. He talked about those that make a good show of things and those that don't make a good show of things and our churches are filled up with people all across America and the world uh, where we've got just exactly that very religious over religious amen and all those in between and it looks to us like people are or are not or where they need to be with God and it's a good thing uh, this morning that I can't look inside your heart it's a good thing that you can't look inside my heart amen but God's not full about the way we look on the outside he knows everything about us amen and there are those that are playing a role and uh, that's what Jesus is talking to he said the scribe and the Pharisees and then he calls them hypocrites because that's where they were uh, they made a great show of religion uh, they made a great show of knowing about God uh, but when it came to practicality when practicing what they supposedly uh, are supposed to know uh, Jesus said that's not the way that it appears to him as God it didn't appear that way to him uh, so those that are not committed to God God knows it amen those that are sinners and sinners indeed God knows it you know there's a place for all of them in the house of God there's a chair there's a seat there's a view for everybody in the world in the house of God uh, some people say well if I go in there it'll fall down on everybody I've never seen a church uh, fall down on everybody no matter how bad that you think you are amen uh, because God has made a way through Jesus' blood for everybody to do what? Draw nigh to Him. He's made the way of salvation plain. It's the way of the cross. It's the way of the shed blood. Jesus has made a way for everyone to come to Him. You're not going to hurt the church building by coming to church, but it may be that the Holy Spirit of God can get a hold of you and make you a better person. Amen. That's why I tell folks, when you get in one church and it doesn't just exactly suit you, don't stop going to church. Get into another church. Find a church where the gospel is preached, where they believe in living right, where they don't compromise on the Word of God, and the preacher tells it just exactly like it is. Amen. That's the church. You feel God leadership in, that's where you need to be. But not just in the seat, not just in the chair, not just in the pew, but at the altar when God speaks to your heart. Amen. Uh, what makes a good church? It's a church filled up with people that love the Lord. And they're willing and obedient to follow His leadership. Amen. There's a lot of good churches around. And so there's no excuse to not find yourself in the house of God when it's church time. Amen. I kind of like what our Facebook uh, uh, church uh, page has it on Bethel Grace Field Baptist Church. And it has a spot in there when the hours of the church are open. And whenever it comes time to it, I'll look on it and it'll say, Open today. Amen. It's Sunday. It's open today. And it'll give the time that it's open. And then on Wednesday night, it's open today. Amen. And I like that. It's letting people know that the church is open. Our problem is there's a lot of people that's not open to the open church. Amen. Under the Holy Spirit in the time of the Word of God and the time around the altar. Uh, it's going to take more than just an outward showing to get to heaven. These had the hour. They looked good. Jesus called them scribes and they were. Jesus called them Pharisees and they were. But He also called them hypocrites. Which they were. Amen. And so what's a hypocrite? It's somebody that pretends to be something 
that they're not. It's pretty plain, isn't it? He said you appear to be something, but you're not that something. In the case that we're talking about, he said you suppose yourself to be somebody that knows the law, you're a scribe, you write the law, it's your job to write records of the law, and then it's, as a Pharisee, it's your job to live out the law, and he said as a scribe and as a Pharisee, you're a hypocrite. Amen. It takes more than head knowledge. It takes a heart desire. Amen. A lot of people are just 16 to 18 inches away from being right with God. Amen. Somewhere in their brain to somewhere in their heart. They're just not making that connection. I don't understand it all, but I love Him in my heart. Amen. Now that's why Oh, What a Savior is one of my favorite songs. That's why Amazing Grace is one of my favorite songs. Amen. Uh, that's why one of my favorite songs is the one that I'm singing. Uh, that's a gospel song that lifts up Jesus Christ and shows me all what a need I have in Jesus before I got saved and after I got saved. Amen. Uh, that I can draw close to Him. Let's look a little bit closer at verse 23. Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrite, for what do you do? You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. These are nothing more than spices. And when he said you pay tithe, he said you're paying 10% of these spices. And it's a good thing to do that. And you know the next part of that, he doesn't go into you don't pay you pay ten percent or you don't pay ten percent of your tithe, uh, your money, your your living, your discount, the things that God also supplied. He supplies your mint, your anise, and your cumin. God supplies all of those, and you pay a ten percent of that. But he doesn't say you pay a ten percent of anything else. What does he get to? Look at the rest of that verse. And he said, you've done those, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. And then he mentions the things that are weightier or more central. You've paid the lighter, now pay the central. What are the central? Their judgment, their mercy, and their faith. Those things aren't going to take anything out of your home. Those things aren't going to take anything out of your bank account. Judgment, no, it's not going to hurt you uh, to give a little bit of that. Mercy, no, it's going to, not going to hurt you to give a little bit of that. It's not going to hurt you to have a little bit of faith and show it. But he's saying to the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites, you're paying the little matters. You're paying attention to them. But those things that are greater, which are judgment, mercy, and faith, those are the things you're forgetting. And where is judgment? Where is the mercy? And where is the faith that he's saying they're not paying attention to? That there are many, it's supposed to be in their heart. So God sees what's on the outside. And then he looks a little further and he sees what's on the inside. Now from one Pharisee to another and from one scribe to another, they look good. Not probably any of them would point to the other and say, you're a hypocrite. Uh, because they pretty much all live about the same way. Not all of them. Uh, there were some that actually did have a close walk with God and got saved in time passing. As we read a little bit further about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, amen, being elders of the church of Israel, and they drew near to God. But the realization is that the majority of them were scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. And you call uh, somebody that is a religious person, Christianity I'm talking about, and you call them a hypocrite, it ought to cut them to the core. It ought to get real close to them. I can't imagine that, amen, my friend, when we stand before God on judgment day, he said, yeah, you've been a Sunday school teacher. Yeah, you've been good on a worship in the church. You come at a regular time. You leave at a regular time. You pay attention uh, to the preaching and amen to the singing. You got your heart, your mind, all around those things. But you're a hypocrite because you're not living it out in your life. Amen. It's easy to come to church. <laughs> Most of the time, uh, sometimes it's a little bit of an effort. Sometimes it's a real effort. But it's a little bit easier than when you leave the church and you go out into the world and you have to live it. 
Even though you've got the Word of God to guide you, even though you've got the Holy Spirit of the inside to give you direction, uh, my friend, when you come to church and you sit and you listen and you sing, not too awful hard, but when you leave the church building, that's the time to put what you hear here in practice out there. If you're not putting it in practice out there, you're no different than they were. Scribe, Pharisee, need I say any more? Hypocrite. Amen. It's just not there. So if you're not committed to God no longer than when you're in the church and you're just barely in, it also leads down, if you would imagine this a little further, you might be able to play it out. If you're just barely committed to God, then you're barely committed to prayer. What is prayer? It's talking to the divine creator of the universe. It's talking to the God that is God. It's talking and praying and supplementing your heart to God, asking for special things and giving Him special praise. That's what prayer is. But if you're barely committed to God, you're probably barely committed to prayer. If you're barely committed to prayer, it might be also that you're barely committed to reading. Reading what? The divine word of God. The only book that has spirit attached to it. It is spirit and it is truth. You think about the thing that we read. Instruction manuals for tools. Uh, things that we do at work. Uh, I have to know understand the word package. And all those things. We read the comic books. We read the newspaper. We read all these things. But we're barely committed to reading the divine living word of God. Amen. Bible. Prayer. When it comes to witnessing, you're probably barely committed to living for God. Amen. When you're out there in the world, uh, the things are going pretty bad, and people are joining you in, all of their dirty talk, their filthy pictures, and you don't say anything, you don't get up and walk away, you remain there, amen. You're barely committed to that, to witnessing for the Lord. All of these things have to do with being barely committed to God. If you're wholeheartedly committed to God, it's going to do what? It's going to show show up in your life. When you leave the church, it's going to show up in your life. Barely committed to tithing and offering. Amen. Uh, the things that God has blessed us with. Uh, the things that He supplies our needs with. Uh, our work. And amen. Uh, I learned a long time ago. If you got, got a dollar in earnings, uh, then you add ten cents in tithes. Amen. May not seem like much. Right? A uh, ten cents. Who can't afford 10 cents, but it's the same thing. Get 10% of a dollar's a dime, a 10% of a thousand's a hundred, and you think about it, it's still the same thing, but the bigger those numbers get, the harder it is to be committed. Amen. But it's the same situation. I heard a fellow talk one time uh, that he didn't have enough money and he asked the preacher to pray for him. Did he get a better job? He got a better job. He quit coming to church, bought himself a big bass boat, and hardly ever came. The preacher went visit. Hey, he said, what's happened? You quit coming to church? He said, the only day I've got off is Sunday and I want to go fishing. And he said, well, I need to pray for you to get a worse job. Amen. We get to the place where we uh, think that just paying that 10% or oh, we've done the will of God. You know what God's also looking for? How we pay attention to the 90 He let us have. Uh, because everything we've got is what He did give us. We didn't get it on our own. God could put you on your, uh, your sick bed tomorrow. Amen. God could make you so sick that you won't be able to work for a week. Then what are you going to do? Amen. I'll tell you what, when it comes down to it and you lose your job, you better have Jesus. Amen. When you get sick, you better have Jesus. You better not wait until you lose your job. You better not wait until you get sick. You better have Him going in. Then you can trust Him in all those things. Amen. And that's what we're talking about. Barely committed to God. Uh, by the way, we need to go all the way to the Lord. We need to give Him our all. We need to get in under our head, over our head. Amen. We need to give God our all. Because the song says, and the belief is, and the trust is, trust and obey. For there is no other way. Amen. Brother Rick, you're talking about being a fanatic. You know what a fanatic is? Somebody's just a fan of Jesus. Amen. Are you a fan of Jesus? Amen. Somebody that 
known as we think about our ball team, whether it be Tennessee or Arkansas or Georgia or Alabama, and people shout and they throw up, uh, go all kinds of ways, and if their team loses, they throw a fit. Amen. If their team's winning, they throw a fit. But when it comes to God, they're not throwing anything. We ought to shout and holler and scream how good God is and praise Him for everything we've got in us. Amen. There's a time coming. You think, but Brother Gary talked about the folks in the nursing home and sometimes people think that they're here too long. God knows how long they need to be here. Amen. Need to trust Him in that. But there's people in the nursing home. There's people in the jails and prisons today that would love to have the opportunity to go to church and shout the glory to God comes a time when we're not able to health wise circumstance wise amen that's why the bible says today is the day of salvation amen now is the time to draw nigh to god now is the time to worship amen we need to draw closer to the lord and let him have his way in our heart during the service look at verse 25 and 26 he said, What do you scribes and Pharisees said for For he may clean the outside the cup and of the planet, but within are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and planted that the outside of them may be clean also. Amen. What things hold food and drink? Our dishes, the platters and the cups. And so he's saying, You may clean the outside of uh, the platter and the cup. You may clean the outside of the dishes, but you turn them over and the places that really matter, uh, that hold the juice and hold the bread of life, those things that got it, you've got them and you're putting that clean stuff on that bad stuff. You've not cleaned the dish and it's full of extortion. It's full of excess. It's full of pollution. How long can you leave a plate, to, a plate that's got food and matter on it before it turns into something you're not going to want to eat on? Our lives should be the same way. Amen. We ought to be clean the inside so that the outside looks right. Whenever you go to somebody's house, do you look at the dishes and you wipe your hand across? Oh, I feel food. I feel food that had been cleaned. That fork, you know. But it's something else when you go to a house and they give you a plate and it's got dried eggs on it. Huh? You go to a restaurant and there's dried meat on the spoon or on the fork. What do you do? Say, hey, waitress, this fork's dirty. A little embarrassing to the waitress. She didn't clean it. Gave my hand. Now the process that goes through didn't clean it good. But here it is. Uh, the cup and the platter's you. You can make it clean. You don't have to go around dirty. Amen. You don't have to go around with corruption in your heart and your life. You can clean yourself up on the inside by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Problem is, a lot of folks are satisfied being dirty, being full of excess. Amen. Not being clean before the Lord. Amen. Holding that food and drink, and that's all the clean that they were. A verse of scripture goes along with it, found in Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Luke 16, 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. The scribes and Pharisees had justified themselves before one another. But they didn't justify themselves before God. Uh, he said then, But God knoweth your hearts. God knows. Amen. You might look good to me, and you do. But how do you look to God? That's what matters. You don't have to pass my specs. You don't have to pass my examination and my judgment or my mercy or my faith. You've got to pass God's outward justification, inward pollution. God knoweth the hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And so we say that cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not a verse of Scripture. It might be a good idea, but that's not the gospel. Amen. I tell you what, what God desires is for our hearts to be clean before Him. Amen. Uh, that what He puts in our heart is going to be uh, able to sanctify our heart and our clean heart before God. Partial Christianity won't get you to heaven. Amen. Uh, you can't go to heaven and die. You can't die and go to heaven with just the outside clean. You've got to get the inside. Cleaned up as well. And now Jesus is not asking them to do something they can't do. But He is asking them to do something they don't want to do. Amen. Pay your tithes. 
of mint, anise, and cumin. And then don't forget judgment, mercy, and faith. Get Him inside your heart. Let Him be a part of your everyday living. Take Jesus from the inside of the church when you go home. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. Every day. Partial Christianity won't get you to heaven. Look at the next verse, verse 27. Woe well, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like the wine sepulchers, which indeed appear out beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all of all uncleanliness. What a picture that paints. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, for within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Let me tell you this. Now you know what they did back in the Bible time uh, for a number of years, uh, a thousand years or more? Uh, when it came time for one of the religious festivals, uh, that would go out, people would go out and they'd take whitewash and they'd paint the sepulchre so that they look clean and they look white. But not only so that they appeared that way, so that somebody that came by, stumbled around that, wouldn't put their hand on on a grave and make them ceremoniously unclean for whatever religious holiday they were getting ready to observe. And Jesus is saying, you look good, you look precious, you're seeable on the outside, but on the inside, what's on the grave? What's in a grave? Amen. Now it looks good on the cemetery to be whitewashed. Huh? It looks good on a graveyard to have all the stones pretty, have them all in line, and have them all decorated and to have all the grass mold. And I remember when uh, Ralph died, and father, my grandfather, or father in law Ralph died, I went to the cemetery at the uh, memorial that they had in that place where all the veterans were buried and all the stones were in line. You could look down on uh, the broad side of them, you could look across them. They were all in line, one after another, all of them white, real pretty looking. Amen. And a lot of them had religious verses on the tombstone and uh, things along that line. But here it is, being looking good in a graveyard, it's real nice. But how do you look inside your heart? That's where we need to get things straightened out with the Lord with. Amen. Uh, so nobody would accidentally touch a grave and become unclean. Get the picture? They got it. You better believe they got it. They didn't like it when Jesus said you're full of dead men's bones, meaning you're full of corruption. You're full of excess. Look at Acts chapter 23. A verse that I found uh, that goes along with this. Acts 23, verse uh, starting with verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. He's talking about when he got saved. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. What and why the mouth? They believe that what Jesus or Paul just said was blasphemy. He had lived before God, right? Not according to them. Then Paul said unto him, to Ananias, God shall smite thee, thou white and wall. You look good as the person that's decorated to be the high priest. For thou sittest thou to judge me after the law and condemnest me to be smitten contrary to the law. What was Paul's crime? He believed what the Sadducees didn't believe, but he believed what the Pharisees believed. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in life after death. And so Ananias, as a Pharisee, was telling those that stood by to smack him in the mouth because of what he said. And Paul said, you're going to smack me because I've told you the truth. Look at the rest of it. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest. Verse 5 ties it all together. Then said Paul, I know not, or I don't know, brethren, that he was the high priest. You couldn't tell he was the high priest of God by his actions. You couldn't tell him he was the high priest of God by his words. You couldn't tell him that he was the high priest of God by his life. The Apostle Paul made a judgment, didn't he? A lot of people say, judge not, lest thou be judged. And that's the verse of Scripture. But he also said that we can judge spiritual things. And what was Paul doing? He was judging a spiritual man who was supposed to be living a spiritual way according to the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the Word. And Paul said, I don't think you're the high priest. You might have that in title. You might look it on the outside. But Paul said, you sure don't act like it. Know anybody that Sure don't look, act like it. Amen. 
That's what he's talking about. Halfway Christianity, halfway religious zeal, halfway commitment won't get you to heaven. You better get in over your head, become a fanatic. He said the Pharisees have been, have been living this way for so long that they come to the place where they can justify themselves before man. A Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't trust your heart. I mean, if you allow lies and you allow sin, after so long a time of living in sin, you justify your life. You justify the wrong that you're doing. All of a sudden, you are able by your way of living to go on in that way. You no longer feel God's condemnation. Amen. Because you've overridden the Holy Spirit of God and God can't reach you no more. Your heart is callous. Before the Lord. Before the Lord. Look at verse 26. One more time. Thou blind Pharisee, you can't see this, you can't make sense of it, cleanse first that which is on the inside, within the cup of the platter. Cleanse that first, that the outside of them may be clean also. So what's he saying? Jesus said, do both of them. Cleanse the inside, clean the outside. I believe that what Jesus is saying there, if you get the inside took care of, you get right with God, you get the Holy Spirit and the Word inside your life, it'll show up outside. Amen? God will clean you up on the outside if you let Him clean you up on the inside. That's what He's talking about. Getting closer to God. He said the same thing in verse 23 when I started. He said, you do the tithe of men and ice and cumin, and then you forget judgment, mercy, and faith. Jesus said, do them all. Do them all. Amen? Do what God would have you to do what His Word teaches. Make sense out of it. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 and 7. Get ready to close. Verses that you know. One of them is a memory verse that we have. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon His name while He's near. Amen? Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. While He's calling on you. When you're in church or when you're driving in your car before you go to bed at night and the Holy Spirit won't let you think nothing else about uh, uh, the world other than God and your heart and your soul and where you're going to spend eternity. Heaven or hell, it's your choice. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call you upon His name while He is near. And then verse 6 or 7. Let the wicked forsake His way. When you call upon God just right, what are you going to do? You're going to repent. You're going to turn away from the world. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Our God will abundantly pardon. I'm too bad to get saved. No, you're not. Don't you believe what God said? He will abundantly say. Doesn't matter how bad you've been. Jesus died to say the how bad. You know, it don't matter how bad you've been, it don't matter where you've been, what you've done, the blood of Jesus Christ is the most powerful thing there is in the world. Most powerful thing that there is in the universe. His blood cleanses sin. Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 16. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. That's what God expects of those that call themselves His. Learn to do well. Practice it. Seek judgment. Pray that God would be in your heart. Judge yourself. Relieve the oppressed. Help people. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, said the Lord. Here it is. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now that's kind of a, a picture that he's drawn for us. And no matter how sinful, how filthy, how wicked your heart and your mind is, God is able to save you. And if you trust Him, He can turn your thoughts, your life around, even make you like yourself. You know, that's one of the hardest things there is. Because whenever that God's Spirit calls you and desires for you to come, 
A lot of times it was with me. I said, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your mercy. And I said this to my spirit when he troubled me. I don't deserve your forgiveness. So I told him. And almost in an audible voice, he said, I don't love you anyway. It broke my heart. It wasn't hell that I became afraid of right then. It was the love of God that drew me to him. Somebody that could love me enough to die for my sin. If I'd have been the only one, Jesus' blood would have still been shed for me. If you would have been the only one, His blood would have been shed for you. You see, J Jesus loved the individual. He died for the person. Jesus came to seek sinner. Put your lives. And call them to you. That's, that's us today. Amen. That's our family and our loved ones. They need Jesus Christ. And as we stand, are you ready for a song? The thought that came to me is that the blood of Jesus makes sinners clean. The blood of Jesus makes sinners clean. I don't know where you are in your walk with God, what your heart and your life may have in it, but I do know this. God loves you above anything you've ever done. Now man may make you pay a judgment for what you've done, Certainly He will. The laws are given. The power of law is given by God. Not if the government is. they got their authority. I'll tell you, friend, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. Jesus loves you enough to have died on the cross to save you from your sin. His blood is the only thing that will wash away your sin. Say this number.